So our second uh, speaker is Dr. Marion Johnston from the Centre for Sustainability at the University of Otago here in Dunedin. Uh, she is an NPM research fellow, research fellow and she's going to explain what that is, based at the Centre for Sustainability. She's worked extensively with Maori communities developing pragmatic strategies to encourage conservation and use of native species, particularly on farms. Her research is guided by the, by the principles of te, te Rongoa, Maori traditional medicine in which the health of a person is intimately linked to the healing of the land. So thank you, Mary. Tatu, and thank you very much for the opportunity to come and talk with you this morning. Tom, my co-author, and I um, felt we could send you away with a list of traditional uses of plants, but we actually wanted to do something more than that, and I hope within this talk we can give you a feeling of the tradition behind the tradition. Now, I'd like to introduce you to my co-author, Tom Walters. I'm afraid he couldn't be here this morning. Now, he's the director and the chief executive officer of um, the Māori Research Institute up in Rotorua, and he's chairman and trustee of a number of Māori land corporations. As he couldn't be here, he suggested that I just read you this paragraph, which really sum up his thoughts. My upbringing taught me humility and to treasure the poetry and emotional richness that makes human life worth living. The water, soil, forests, mountains and air are sacred to the memory of our people. They've been hallowed by the bones of our ancestors and the traditions of people holding fast to their roots. When we deal with memories, we need to take them seriously to attain the spiritual strength and inspiration from that knowledge. So I give you my co-author, Tom. We're talking about traditional plant use, so we need to know there are 6,698 indigenous plants in New Zealand, 2,418 of them are vascular plants, and approximately, as Alan told us yesterday, 82% are endemic. Chipper, thank you for doing all this bit <laughs> and about Maori arrival and Polynesian journeys because they really were brilliant navigators. And I'd actually decided not to get involved with this because there are huge arguments of when Maori arrived in Aotearoa, New Zealand. But we do know that they navigated incredible distances. They arrived here in several waka we're going to say around about the year 1200. What is not debatable is that they arrived to an incredibly different climate and ecology from the one they left behind. Now when they traveled, they no doubt, as we do, traveled with their baggage, and in that baggage would have been a whole host of tropical plants. Unfortunately, only a few of those have survived to when Europeans arrived and recorded them. So the kumara, the bottle gourd, and the taro survived. The cabbage tree, and I point out this is a different cabbage tree, this is not our New Zealand native. The paper mulberry and the yam were still in cultivation when Cook arrived. But these people brought tropical plants to this long, skinny island that covers a huge number of climate zones. I'm sorry, this map's not very clear. It's borrowed from the Niwa website. Just to illustrate, I don't know if I point the right thing, the number of climate zones we have. So up here in the north, we have a subtropical climate. It's quite humid. Come down the east coast, you're getting dry and sunny. Come down to where we are in southern New Zealand, and as you've seen, we've got changeable weather. We're the first stop for the southerlies from Antarctica. Drive two hours in from Dunedin to here, and you're in minus 20 in the winter, plus 30 in the summer. 
So we've got a huge, huge climate range, and this has obviously got a big effect on plant distribution. The other term we have to deal with is Māori, because Māori is actually a generic term that was given to the people of the land when, European came here, when Europeans came here. So it's actually very difficult to talk about Māori traditional plant use, because Māori are a number of tribes, or iwi, and each of these iwi are then subdivided down into hapu, or sub-tribes. And each of these sub-tribes comprise whānau, or extended family. So each of these tribes have their own dialect often, they have their own plant uses, they have their own way of being, although they are Māori. So I just put that out to you to remember as well. So we've got different climate zones, we've got different plant distributions, we have different iwi. So obviously, although we're talking about traditional plant use, we do need to remember that the different tribes used plants differently, or they may actually have used different plants for the same purpose. I've also got to take issue with the word traditional, of course, because we've taken issue with every other part of the, um, the title. It's really fraught because communities, all our communities evolve. They change, they innovate, they take breadfruit on board. So what is traditional? If you go down the high street in Dunedin today and you say, okay, what's a traditional plant for Māori? Everybody go, watercress. And sure, it's used all the time. But actually, watercress came to New Zealand in 1840, courtesy of the French who brought it to Akaroa. So how traditional is our traditional plant? All of that aside, Māori arrived here in Aotearoa, New Zealand, and they faced a completely different climate, ecology, plant range, and they adapted. They found food, medicine, shelter, tools, everything they needed for hunting and fishing to make fire. It was an incredible, incredible achievement. So when we speak of traditional uses of plants, it's also vitally important to understand the relationship between plants and people, and again, Chipper alluded to this. Now here, our creation story tells the story of Tani Mahuta, and he and his siblings pushed Papatuanuku, the Earth Mother, and Ranganui, the Sky Father, apart, and thus they created the sky and the earth. And then Tane created all the plants and the forests to begin with. Then he created the insects and the animals. And then finally, as in Chipper's legends, he created humans. So we have this absolute intimate connection between the plants and the people of Aotearoa, New Zealand. And the other thing we really must remember when we're talking about our relationships with plants is that actually, they're our respected elders. They were created before we were, and we should treat them in this way. So Māori, like many other indigenous peoples, have the strong sense of conservation of their environment. The ways that plants are harvested and used are all underpinned by cultural guidelines. Now, Felicity, um, talking from Doc yesterday, introduced the concept of kaitiakitanga. Tikanga, part of this word, is the protocols, the way to act. Everything is governed by tikanga. You know how to behave. Kaitiaki, they're the guardians. Kaitiakitanga, the guardianship of our environment, based upon a Māori worldview. There are lots of advisory principles, as there are in every indigenous culture. You know, take only what you need. Hunt and fish only for food. Only harvest what the tree can give you. Rahui, or temporary bands, can be placed on an area to allow it to recover. 
never harvest more than a third of the kawakawa and don't go back until it's recovered. And so we can go on. The other principle that Tom and I really would like you to um, take on board to understand is that of Māori. And that is the life force. Now, everything has life force. The plants, the trees, the rocks, the earth, you have life force. There is a life force in this building. So the first part of this talk, I hope we've given you a feeling for tradition, for Māori worldview, for this important life force and how important it is to conserve it. So as a transition, I've just put up some pictures here of life in Aotearoa, New Zealand in the 1800s. So this is um, a young girl beside her vegetable garden with her fori there. This was taken in 1880. This was painted um, in 1847 as Pa and Whanganui. People growing kumara and a beautifully carved storehouse. So this is setting the scene for our traditional foods. Now Māori collected a wide variety of plant foods, roots, tubers, green vegetables and berries. They had plenty of meat, they had birds, they had kaimoana seafood. What they needed was carbohydrate. And fern root was the stable carbohydrate. It grew the length of the country. Remember, they couldn't rely on kumra because those would only grow in the north. And potatoes didn't arrive until European contact. So fern root was absolutely the basis of their carbohydrate diet. Now, the best rhizomes, when you dug them up, broke nice and crisply. And those fern root patches were prized by far now. Poor fern root, you could still eat it, but it was very stringy and astringent. When you dug the rhizome up, you roasted it in the embers, and you beat it and peeled it. The cabbage tree, tikuka, was another plant which was prized. You could eat the whole of this plant. You could break off the heart and center up in here, pull that off the tree, peel out the outside leaves and eat the centre, either raw or cooked or, ba or um, baked. And when I was doing a little bit more research about this topic, I came across a story where one iwi used to actually take the heart leaves, fill the centre with eel or bird, plait it all up, bake it, and then eat the whole basket. What a tremendous, sustainable meal. Other people... Um, the stem was used, the stem of young trees was used to make kora. They cut the stems off, peeled them, bundled them up and baked them in earth ovens or umu tea. And after they'd cooked for about 12, 24 hours, the stems were taken out and stored. So this was a really good storable form of food. They could either be just chewed as they were or they were pounded down with water to make a gruel. And if you do have any time to explore Dunedin after the Congress and you go out the peninsula for the wonderful wildlife, you'll actually find umuti out there, are these big hollows are about seven metres long, old umuti out on the peninsula. So we've dealt with the leaves, the stem. They actually dug up the rhizomes as well, and these were very tasty. They were baked or steamed or roasted over a fire. Karaka is a really interesting tree. This was one of the few trees that Māori actually took and planted deliberately around par sites and dwellings. It has this wonderful, wonderful orange fruit, which is actually incredibly toxic. The fruit's got this outer orange skin, a fleshy layer, and then a kernel inside, which is again rich in carbohydrate, and it has some protein but incredibly toxic. There is this toxin karakin in it, and if people ate it, it relaxes the joints, and then convulsions occur, so people's necks just dislocated. And actually reading the way to treat people who'd eaten, eaten this fruit was to bury them in the ground, put a gag in their mouth, and stand on them to stop everything moving. It doesn't say whether it was really very efficacious or not. But, wonderful source of carbohydrate. So it was harvested and then put in baskets, cooked for about two days, put in the creek, the water washed away the outer skins, and at that point the kernels were safe to eat. 
onto a safer food, one that most of you probably know, which is the New Zealand spinach. So it's traditionally used as a green vegetable, and those little fine leaves were picked out in this part of the world in summer and autumn. Further up north, they could eat it all year. If you started using the older outer leaves, they were a little bitter, so they were cooked with um, the root of our native convolvulus and that took the bitterness away and it became an acceptable meal. And just out of interest, New Zealand spinach was sent to Kew in 1772. And from there it's spread around Europe. One last foodstuff. Again, it's another plant that you can eat from top to bottom, and that's the raupo, or our bulrush. Incredibly, the pollen was used to make pollen cakes, now, people would go out there early in the morning and break those spikes off, tap them down on baskets, extract the pollen, mix it with water, wrap it in leaves, and bake it to make a pollen cake. In the East, remember I said different iwi have different traditions. In the East Coast and North Island, they used to take manuka beetles, crush them up, mix them with the pollen, and make a very nutritious cake. The rhizomes were dug up, they could be eaten raw, as in the top here, peeled off and eaten raw, crunched up and the fibers spat out, or they were baked, and then rubbed between the hands and the starch removed. There are only occasional records in New Zealand of the young stems being eaten, whereas um, I believe a lot of cultures around the world actually really enjoy, enjoy the young stem of Raupo, but our people only ate them very occasionally. As I said, plants have a multitude of uses, so we're transitioning from eating raupo, you can actually make it into boats as well, but it was often used to, um, to make houses, raupo foris. And this is a picture here of a family in 1870 outside their raupo house. When the early settlers came here, this is what they often lived in too, these raupo foris. And down here, this is a new construction that's just been made up in Northland because the community were worried that they were losing the ability and the skills. So they set out to build a new Raupo Fori and apparently it's quite warm inside and fairly waterproof and not bad at all. Although perhaps not our first choice. Now to me, if we've got shelter and we've got food and this cool, damp climate, the thing we really need is fire. And fire must have been incredibly difficult. It was made by rubbing two sticks together. The lower stick was made of, uh, I'll get the right thing here, it was made of mahoe. This is very soft wood, and they put a groove in it. The upper stick was made of kaikamako, this tree here, which was very hard. The stick was then um, flaked off and polished with um, a shell or a piece of obsidian so that it could be inserted into the Mahoe groove and just rub vigorously backwards and forwards, friction creating fire. And then fluff from either the Raupo plant that we looked at before, or moss or flax was put there until it burst into flame. Then more dried Raupo was put on top. I've just put some pictures up there from various books and libraries just to show how incredibly difficult it must have been to make fire. And if you um, want to access YouTube and have a look, put, type in um, Māori making fire, I think it is. And up on a marae in the east coast, they've got a clip of this bear grill survive anywhere type character attempting to make fire like this. And he really struggles. He gets there in the end, but it takes him a very long time. And it just gives me such huge respect for these people and how they adapted to the land and how they had to live. Much simpler, easier thing to do with wood is obviously carving. And carvings preserve actually much of the culture and history of Māori, as the basic patterns were actually brought from the ancestral homelands. We had an abundance of timber such as totoro and kauri here, beautiful trees for carving. Many things were carved. This is a Whoranui, or the meeting houses. This is actually the one in Waitangi. Waka, canoes were all carved. Weapons of war. 
And down here, my favourite, these are um, wakahuya, which are little treasure boxes in which all the um, feathers and special things were kept. So our people are here, they've got shelter, they've got food, they're cooking. They then had to develop a system of medicine. Remember, they haven't been able to bring many of their plants with them. And it's incredible the knowledge they gained in a very short period of time of New Zealand plants. Now, Rangoa Māori is a holistic system of medicine. It's not about curing the disease. It's about being healthy. And it requires that you have a healthy mind, a healthy spirit. Spirit is very important. It must be calm and untroubled. You have a good family relationship. You have a good relationship with the land you come from. And the land you come from is healthy as well. And then again, you have a healthy body. Māori did use herbs. This is Rongoa Rākau, the use of plants for treatment. But Medicine is holistic. I've popped a couple of plants up there. Um, go, wrong button. This is Aristelia. This was used um, for burns and skulls. And it's, quite, and it's apparently still very effective for rheumatism and arthritis. Here we have Puriri. This is a North Island endemic. And an infusion of this was used for sore throats. This is Horopito, our pepper bush. If you go to Orokuni, Orokanui tomorrow, there's a lot of Horopito growing there, and I don't know if they'll let you try it, but it's an interesting, nice, lovely, peppery taste. But that was used um, to make poultices and then used internally to lower fevers and to deaden pain. Now... Uh, Rob McGowan, who's quoted up here, is one of the modern practitioners of Rongoa. And Rob spent many, many hours with his elders in the bush. And one thing that he often repeats is that he used to pester his guides for plant knowledge. You know, what do you use this plant? How do I cure that? And they would refuse to answer him. And they would just say, you need to open your eyes and become part of the bush which is something you were alluding to, Anne, becoming part of your environment. And when you do that, the plants will speak to you and they will tell you what they will be used for. And the way the plant protects itself and heals itself will teach us how to do this. The way the plant defends itself against a bacterial virus, it may well be used in the same way for us. I've just picked a couple of plants, as I can get sidetracked into Rongoa traditional medicine for hours. Kawakawa, this is a really significant plant in Māori life. It's significant from birth to death. It used to be slipped by women under the mattress for conception. It accompanies you out of this life in funeral rites. But a poultice of kawakawa was used for cuts and wounds and skin diseases. The, the leaves were um, infused and gently bruised, and it's absolutely wonderful when they're then packed on for toothache. In fact, I was talking to one of the interns yesterday out there, and she was telling me how their family used to use kawakawa for toothache. So, I mean, it survives to the present day. Internally, if you take kawakawa tea, which is actually quite bitter, so just expect that, it's a tonic. It has been recorded as being used for bladder conditions and digestive tract pains, but its real strength is in respiratory diseases and asthma, and it's taken at the first sign of a cold coming on. Now, the elders will always say the best leaves to use are these, the ones that have been chewed by caterpillars. And we would suggest, and we'd love to do some research on this, that probably, going back to Rob McGowan and the plant will tell you, these plants have then had to defend themselves, so the allelo chemicals are much higher in those leaves, and that's why they're more efficacious. Kawakawa was also used as a fumigant. It was the leaves, branches were laid down in the kumara patches and lit, and the smoke... Um, sent the insects away. 
Harakiki, or New Zealand flax, is another hugely important plant. This plant was so highly valued that when a Māori chief was talking to some European um, settlers, he said to them, this doesn't grow in England. How can you survive without this plant? It was absolutely integral to Māori life. It was used for weaving, it was used for making clothes, it um, could be made into string. I've got a picture of cattle having eaten, eaten this. They love it too, but you can see how it's stringy. Um, the, the stems, the flower stems up here were made into torches. The leaf was incredibly important in ceremony and divination. When you come to the medicinal uses of it, again, that thick base, I nearly brought a flax plant in with me this morning because I suddenly realized we didn't have any, anything native down here, but it has a very thick base and that was used as a splint and then the longer leaves were wrapped around as a bandage. When it was cut, as you can see in here, you can't really see the jelly, but as you slice it, there's a jelly in there and that's excellent for healing cuts and blisters and scalds and it's a very good antiseptic. Flax roots, flax roots are also very good, and Māori actually used to use them, treat them gunshot wounds, and apparently they were very efficacious. Again, the roots are also a very good antiseptic and a cure for ringworm. Taken internally, flax um, is a very good purgative, and um, again, has a very good reputation for getting rid of worms. Now, you don't just go out and harvest that plant. Each flax plant grows in a fan. So in the center of that is the youngest leaf, and that is the child. Next to it, you have the parents, the grandparents, and the extended whanau. So when you harvest flax, you go out and you cut the outer leaves, and you never, ever touch the internal family. And that way, flax will continue and that is a sustainable harvest. So I'm getting near to the end of my time. <laughs> so I'm just going to quickly run through some of the resurgence of traditional values because it's all very well to have the Cessna botany in the books, but it's really good if we can use it today. And the thought that Tom and I had was that it's almost impossible for us to keep the mataronga, or the knowledge concerning the use of plants alive, if we don't have those plants. So the loss of biodiversity impacts us all in many ways. But for indigenous people, with the loss of biodiversity goes the loss of the ability to practice and to pass on their knowledge. And as more and more older gener you know, the older generation are dying, we're losing that knowledge. And I'm going to be very rude here and say that academic discussion and high-level discussion is wonderful. We need it, but we also need to be out on the ground, working with people and conserving these plants. Now, in the field of Rongoa, traditional medicine, um, we have Tikahui Rongoa now, which is the Rongoa Collective working together. There are Rongoa clinics opening up, and there is a strong move to include Rongoa in the, in the mainstream health service. And in some areas of the country, it is. There are pharmacological studies being undertaken of our plants, of course, not only the chemistry, but searching for antioxidants, antifungals, antivirals. In terms of foodstuffs, I'm just going to pick on Charles Royal, who is a wonderful chef in Rotorua, and if you're heading up that way, go on the Maori food trail. It's great fun. Um, he's done a lot. He's introduced pico pico back onto our plates, the hen and chicken's fern, lovely. He actually provides most of New Zealand from six hectares, just sustainably harvested. He's developed things like horopito pepper and kawakawa bush basil. And um, he's also developed a lot of modern recipes. So I so say if you do go up there, track him down, and he has wonderful kawa kawa shortbread. It's gorgeous. The other person I'd like to introduce you to is James Webster. Now, he and another group of artists are reinvigorating Māori 
traditional music and Māori puppetry, which had almost disappeared. And James is growing the gourds, recarving them, carving other, other musical instruments, and performing around the country. Now, Anne said I would explain what NPM was. <laughs> this is Ngāpai o Tamaramatanga, who I'd like to acknowledge because they fund me and my research. And having made that comment about having to work on the ground, I just thought I'd um, talk to you for a minute about our Te Rongoa project, which is with a Māori trust farm up on the Banks Peninsula, where we're taking the principles of Te Rongoa and applying it to farm management. So healing the land, healing the stock, and um, revitalizing traditional activities. Now, I was going to show you the second film clip just to remind you about the principle of Māori and how important it is to preserve Māori. But instead, I'll just thank you all for your attention. Thank you very much. Thanks, Marion.